Hey everyone, Fraser here. Uh, welcome to a very special episode of The Guide to Space. I'm here in Iceland with my buddy Paul Sutter. And a bunch of friends. And a bunch of friends. <laughs> Doing that. I know, I, I know, it never, it never gets old. Uh, we're gonna do a very special episode of The Guide to Space. We've got a really interesting topic, and so let's just get into it. And the gist of it is that as we develop more and more powerful instruments in astronomy, will we reach a limit where we can no longer discover anything about the universe? And where are we in that process right now? The answer is yes. That's sad and that's already. It. That's the end of the show. Like that's all we need. Yeah. No, there there is a. I will, I promise I will yeah. not thump yeah. the right. table right. anymore. I'll, okay. get, I'll do yeah, this. Yeah, you get the one thump I'll on get the, the table, one and that's thump. it. Yeah. There is a fundamental limit to the amount of data, the amount of information in the universe. There's only so many arrangements of atoms and molecules out there that if we're trying to dig up deep answers on the nature of the expansion of the universe or how stars work and evolve, there's only so many stars to collect. There's only so many galaxies. There's only the one universe that right. we live so, in. So since the observable universe is a finite amount of information, some you know 10 to the power of 90 bits of a information. Lot. A lot. A lot, but finite. Yeah, but finite. Then there is a limit to how much you can know right. if you know it all. Right. Right. But I think we can pretty safely say that we are nowhere near knowing it all. Correct. Right. <laughs> right. In, in most fields of astronomy and fundamental physics, we are very, very far away from that limit. We've only barely begun to scratch the surface of the things, the total amount of knowledge that we can collect about our universe. And so there are a lot of mysteries that we have, like what is dark energy? We're very, very far away from tapping out every possible source of information to answer that question. But there are some interesting places where we are beginning to encounter some limits. Right, so what are some places where, where we are already pretty much at the edge of what can be known? One of the biggest examples is the cosmic microwave background, this leftover light from the early universe, this baby picture generated when the universe was 270,000 years old, 13.8 billion years ago. If you just look at the temperature, the tiny temperature differences that tell us what the early universe looked like, we have a satellite that in just a few years ago completed its mission, the Planck satellite, right. took a global map of those temperature differences. And the data that Planck collected on the global scale is pretty much all the data available in the cosmic microwave background. But I don't understand. Like, why can't you just make a better Planck, one that has a hundred times the sensitivity or a thousand times the sensitivity of the current spacecraft, go peer again at the globe, and now you should be measuring even better temperature variations on the cosmic microwave background. Why wouldn't you want to do that, and why can't you get any more information? Right, it, it's, there are, in, in any kind of science, there are three sources of uncertainty that limit the amount of knowledge you can collect. One is statistical uncertainty, the, the, the limit of the number of objects that you're studying, whether it's stars, whether it's people in a classroom or whatever, that's gonna limit your knowledge. There's gonna be some uncertainty around it. The second is systematic uncertainty. If your instrument itself has some flaws in it or some variation, that's gonna introduce some uncertainty into the day and that will limit how much you can know. So even if you collected more and more stuff, if your instrument is a little bit wonky, you're not gonna get any more bang for your buck. Right, but my super plank isn't going to be suffering Okay, so that. so you you have much larger budgets yeah. than NASA. Yeah. Now there's the third source of uncertainty, which we're beginning to hit when it comes to cosmology. And this is the fact that we only live in one universe. We only have one universe accessible to us. And since so many things in our universe, like the patterns in the cosmic microwave background, like the arrangement of galaxies at the very largest scales are the result of fundamentally statistical processes and we only have one result of that statistical process it's like if you were at a casino and someone dealt you a deck of cards and you had to guess what was the statistics of the cards that the dealer had in their hand and you only have that one draw to judge you're going to be limited in what you can know 
because you only get that one chance, that one universe. And this we call this cosmic variance or cosmic uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And Planck is there. Our statistical uncertainties, our systematic uncertainties are better, stronger than the fundamental cosmic variance on the global scale, which means you could build a super Planck, but you're still studying the exact same universe. You don't get to learn anything so new. So I would come up with the same answers with no greater accuracy than Planck. Yeah, because it's limited by the fact we only live in one universe, not by the the relative crappiness of your your experiment. But are there many cases where we've got instruments that are at the at this fundamental level where we can learn no more about this question? No, and thankfully we still have centuries of of astronomy and cosmology to do. So don't cut off any funding. <laughs> right, yes. yes, we're not there yet. We're not yeah. done. We're not done. It's only in a few of these interesting edge cases where we're starting to run into limits. But now. You, you start have to answer a much more difficult question, which is we've mined the easy stuff. The CMB is relatively easy to, to collect cosmological information from. Now, if we want to understand dark energy or figure out what dark matter is, we have to go to harder and harder probes of cosmology to get those answers. And that takes more instruments, takes more funding, more analysis, it's trickier, it's more difficult, and there's a point where it's diminishing returns, where you're for each million dollars or billion dollars spent, you're gonna learn less and less about the universe because it's getting harder and harder to pull that information out. So then what are some, some parts of this, some observatories or some kinds of uh, observations, surveys that you could do that would kind of allow you to continue answering questions and, and when will they tap out? Yeah, and th this is actually an interesting discussion that's happening in the astronomical co community every single year. In every 10 years, we run what's called a decadal survey where all the astronomers in the world get together and try to convince each other that their personal pet project is deserving of the most amount of money. And they, we run analyses, we run tests, we run forecasts, say, okay, if we put a billion dollars into this kind of space probe, in this kind of analysis, we expect this kind of return. We, uh, we'll understand dark energy a little bit more. Oh, but maybe we should spend the billion dollars over here and we'll we'll learn a little about it a little bit more. And we try to convince ourselves, and there's a lot of arguing yep. involved, to, to get at that answer, to get at that resolution. And it's a continually evolving process. And it's a continually more difficult process as funding flatlines and diminishes over the course of decades that becomes a more and more fierce competition of, of when you only have $1 billion instead of $10 billion, you better make sure you spend it on just the right place. Right, which, you know, depending on who you ask, what it's is totally the right- It's totally debatable. Right, what is the right place? Yeah. But, but, you know, sort of back to that, what is some next surveys that should and could be done where, you know, now that say the CMB is fully mapped out, right. what is the next thing that should be and could be fully mapped out? Well, the next thing, the, the thing we're targeting now is the large scale structure of the universe itself, the arrangement of galaxies at the very largest scales. The arrangement of galaxies is directly related to the ingredients of the universe. If you change how much dark matter or how much dark energy is in the universe, then it's like changing the ingredients in a cupcake and you're gonna end up with different kinds of cupcakes with different kinds of ingredients. So we can run the clock backwards. If we look at the present day universe, we can see, get some understanding of what the past was, what the fundamental ingredients are. That's where we're starting to push now over the next five to 10 years, very detailed galaxy surveys, but it's very, very, very hard. It's much more difficult to go from galaxies to dark energy than it is to go from the pure, pristine cosmic microwave background to something like dark energy. So we're spending the same amount of money to do ever harder problems, and we're gonna learn less and less relatively about the universe. And so then theoretically, say we get to a certain point with that survey and with other surveys, are we going to reach a point you know, not the we've mapped out every single particle in the universe, but are we going to reach some point in the near future where we can really not learn anything else? The, that is the worry. That is what keeps a cosmologist up at night is 
And it all depends on what is the value of dark energy? What Does it change with time? Does it evolve? We're basically running these experiments, running these massive observations, and crossing our fingers, hoping that there's a surprise, hoping that there's some hint of a signal that tells us something interesting is going on. That that way we can justify the next generation. Say, oh, we, we caught the hints of an interesting signal. We, we're, we have the hints now. We have our teeth into it. Now we can pour our resources into it to really fine tune it and really get a handle on what's going on. But if there's no strong signals, if there's nothing really obvious sitting there in the data, in the arrangement of galaxies or the cosmic microwave background, then it's like, do we spend another $10 billion to get an answer of the same answer we had 10 years ago? That becomes a progressively harder challenge. This is exactly what's happening in particle physics. Right, so it's not just this field of astronomy. Right. It's in almost every field is starting to run up against these same Barriers, bottlenecks, barriers. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, we see this in particle physics. We have the standard model of particle physics, which is an enormously successful theory of how fundamental fundamental interactions happen and work, and it's so successful that we haven't been able to break it yet. Right. Which really sucks because we'd love to break it. We'd love to get some Nobel right. prizes awarded for yeah. some breakthrough discovery, so we can lead to a better understanding of our universe. But no, every major experiment just keeps confirming the standard model. And we're just like, oh, Yeah, you had said that the, that the Large Hadron Collider had made essentially the worst possible outcome. Right. Was that it had discovered the Higgs boson as exactly predicted. Exactly as predicted. And then, and then nothing else. And nothing else. And it's, nothing that would overturn or give strength to supersymmetry or any of these other ideas. It just did its one job. So, yeah, so it's like, okay, the standard model is right. Um, yeah. So. Get back to work, boys. Like, what, what is there to yeah. do? What is there to do? And this is a crisis of conscience that the particle physicists are having of, of what do we do now? What do we do now? And the worry is that the same thing will happen in cosmology and even more fundamental astronomy. Right. I mean, I think about the, the observational astronomers who are observing extrasolar planets. They got tons of room to find more and more planets. Oh, they're but, surprised, and that's but why. But once again, you can kind of imagine there comes yeah. this time when we have fully mapped that's out it. all of the extrasolar planets within reach of our most powerful telescopes possible, and we just can't see anything else. And that is exactly why there's so much interest, not just in the public, but in the astronomical community for things like exoplanets, because it's new. There's something, there's a brand new weird world every single week, and that draws curiosity that draws interest that draws funding because it's it's something new it's not just you know spending a billion dollars to try to get a better handle on dark energy we've been working on that for two decades well here's something brand new and exciting and so there's a lot of interest in that in the community and shifting and this is how trends in astronomy work over the course of centuries so do you think on sort of the current pace of science there will come a day when there is nothing left to discover. And, and, and I mean, I know that that is a argument and that is sort of a claim that people have been saying, you know, back a hundred years ago. We figured it we, all yeah, out. Yeah, the end of science. Turn off all the telescopes. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, you know, that we've, we've made all of these fundamental understandings in all of these fields and we're done. And that claim keeps getting made. Do you think there will be a day when discoveries in science are over? Yes, that day isn't for like a thousand years, yeah, at yeah, least. Yeah. Because thankfully, nature keeps managing to surprise us. Where we go out and we build a survey to study one thing, and then there's some little blip in the data that no one was planning on, and maybe even ignored right. for years and years. And then we look back and hey, what was this thing? Yeah. Oh, wow, it's a brand new physical phenomena that we previously right. had absolutely no idea. And it could very well be the case that one of these little blips could be a complete overturning of everything we understand about yeah, how science that'd be awesome. works entirely. That'd be awesome. Yeah. 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 And I think it's really important. You know, you say that would be awesome. People are always like, oh, science scientists are so close-minded. They can't wait to find out that they're wrong. Especially if they prove a competitor wrong. <laughs> That's the best part. When right. you can drive a stake into a, a, a into compete, someone, in someone else's theory, heart, yeah. and then you get the free trip to Stockholm, yeah. that's like, oh, that's yeah. that's that's, but, that's better than the million bucks. But, but second is to have your own theory overturned. You're totally cool with that. Yeah, we'll take, it, we'll take that as a second. <laughs> right. I mean, they're, they're, it will take a lot of convincing. I mean, people, yeah. scientists included, can be stubborn people, but the evidence always wins. Nature always speaks first and loudest. And 
eventually you will be proven wrong. And it might, you may even take your pet theory, your pet model to the grave, and then your ultimate defeat is that no one else will continue your research because no one else buys it. And so there's this old joke from Wolfgang Pauli that physics advances one funeral at a time. Right. Uh, but but because that's the natural human thing to do, but the, the trends in science are always pushing closer and closer to what nature tells us. Right. Paul, where do people find out more? They can find me on my website, pmsutter.com. That has links to all my shows, including Ask a Spaceman here on YouTube and the podcast, uh, Space Radio, uh, my TV appearances, my articles, all the juicy stuff. Right on. Thanks, everyone, for joining us here in Iceland. Woo!